Hello friends and welcome to this video. It is focused on walking with a loving God. I know that Jesus wants to walk with us and talk with us. And in that fellowship, he blesses us with great comfort and peace and hope. Let's pray and welcome him in this time. Bow your hearts with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you and praise you that you are good and that your love endures forever. We thank you, Jesus, that you are near to those who call upon you. Lord Jesus, may it be so that we walk close to you, that we know you, that we don't just have a religion, Lord, but that we have you within our religion. We want to honor you with our lives. And we want to know you. And we want to please you. And we want to be filled with your Holy Spirit. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would grant us these treasures through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, let's begin with a few hymns. I'd like to start with the hymn, In the Garden. Yes, our risen, living, loving Savior Jesus walks with us and talks with us and assures us that we belong to Him. Let's sing another hymn. It's called, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
What a beautiful hymn. And the fellowship that we have with Jesus continues to grow, that he truly is our Lord and Savior, the shepherd who leads our life, but also the dearest, nearest friend, greater than we can ever imagine. It continues to grow. It's a beautiful friendship that we have with Jesus. Now, friends, I have a story to tell you. Now, I want to give you a heads up here. It's a bit tragic, but it's a very important story. So let me share this with you. An apartment caught on fire and was engulfed in flames. A woman grabbed a fire extinguisher and fought her best to overcome the blaze around her, but to no avail. The fire was just too intense. Backed into a corner, the woman held tightly to her empty extinguisher. There was no hope, no way out. She knew that without a miracle, there was no escaping certain death. Then suddenly, from out of the darkened smoke came a strong, sturdy fireman, dressed in full protective gear. He reached out his hand to the woman, saying, I'm here to rescue you. Quick, come with me. Amazingly, the woman refused his help. She said, I've heard about you firemen. You should have prevented this disaster. I can't trust you to save me. And she refused to take his hand so he could lead her to safety. Are you surprised by this woman's reaction? Who wouldn't be? Perhaps you're thinking, oh, there's no one who would refuse such help. Yet, this is the kind of event that continually takes place in our world daily. Let me explain. You see, our time in this world is temporary. At least compared to eternity, it's so short. The end of our journey here in this world comes much sooner than we, we may want. Yet, when the Lord extends His hand to save us and promise us eternal life, Many people refuse his help. Why is this so? I believe that one of the reasons is that many people have unanswered questions about God. Questions like, does God really love me or even care about me personally? Or questions like, is it really possible or how is it possible for God to truly know and walk and talk with every single person who looks to him? We hear questions, you may want to fill in the blank, but why did God do and then fill in the blank? And why doesn't God do things? And then there's so many questions like that. Here's another one I was thinking of. With so many religions in this world, how can we know which one is right and true? Perhaps you have your own questions, or you know people that are asking questions that maybe you can't even answer. But I want you to know that when we have questions and there's not clear answers to, the, to our sincere questions, it could be very daunting and confusing. Many people just throw up their hands and say, what's the use? But when they do this, they miss out on some of the greatest blessings God has and God wants to pour out into our lives. So we need to have answers to our questions about the Lord. And I want you to know this, that God is not afraid of our questions. He's not afraid to answer the sincere and humble questions of any seeker. Many years ago, the Lord told his people, he said in Jeremiah, call to me, and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. That's Jeremiah 33. And also in the same book, Jeremiah 29, he says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You see, God will speak to us when we read the Bible with a humble heart. So let's look at what he says in the Bible today and find assurance of his salvation plan, not only for us, but for our loved ones and the people who live around us. You see, friends, 
God truly loves you and every individual in this world, and he wants to walk with us and talk with us. But there's a problem. Let's look on our papers and see what verse number one says, because it explains what the problem is. It says here, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, sin is the problem. We are born in sin. It's like a disease in our soul. We can't help but be born in it. We, we come to life and sin is in us. And the problem is that God hates sin, not because sin harms him, but because sin prevents us from having this fellowship with God. He hates the things that separate us from him. And he calls this separation death. It's a spiritual death to be separated from God. So if we are sinners from birth and we are spiritually dead, how can we have spiritual life and fellowship with him? Well, verse 2 begins to reveal the answer. Let's look at verse 2 together. It says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, isn't that good news? So let's say that together. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's all say that again. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if someone says to us, you know, the wages of sin is death, you can say, but. And when they say, but what? You can say, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ha <laughs> isn't that great? So let's look at what the gift of God is all about in verse number three on your paper. This is a very familiar verse, but let's read it. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. You see, God does not want us to perish, so he gave us his son Jesus as a gift. And Jesus was sent from God to deliver us from our sin. You know, it cost him his life. Yes, Jesus paid for every one of our sins by his death on the cross. Please always understand this. Jesus did not come to this world to condemn us for our sin. He came to give us life, to save us from sin, so that we can live with him forever. A lot of people have a misconception of God, his anger, his wrath. Yes, he hates sin. He's angry about sin. And he, people who embrace sin experience many troubles that are unnecessary. But I want you to know that though our sin is great, God's love is greater. Let's look at verse number four. It clearly expresses God's heart. It says this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, Jesus did not wait for mankind to obey the law of God. He did not wait for mankind to do what is right. The Father did not wait for us. While we were still sinners, he loved us and sent his only begotten Son and he gave his life for us. Jesus died and was buried, and God raised him from the dead. And all that of those acts and all that work that Christ did for us is what frees us from our sin and moves us from spiritual death to spiritual life. You see, since Jesus paid for our sins, we can be completely forgiven for every single one of our sins. And when our sins are washed away, there's nothing to keep us from entering into the eternal fellowship with God. And that's what spiritual life is all about. 
You know, when I said this, I used the word can. Let me say that again, okay? Since Jesus paid for our sins, we can be completely forgiven for our sins. So I use the word can here because it does not happen automatically. The Father and His Son Jesus did everything necessary for this relationship to be possible. Now we have something that we must do to enter into this relationship and grow close to Jesus. And that's why I said we can have this life. Because when a person says, I will not take the hand of Jesus that is held out to me to save me, and bring me into life, we cannot be saved. It's just like the woman in the apartment. She cannot be saved if she refuses it. God does not force anyone. But I want you to know that his hand is mercifully and graciously held out to each and every one of us that we can be saved. Are you willing to do your part? Well, friends, there are three important steps that I've written out on your paper. These steps I believe we must take in order to grow close to our Lord. And the first step is to receive and believe Jesus as God's way of salvation, his free gift to save you and I. Look, let's look at this verse at step number one. It says here, To all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born by natural descent, but born of God. I've underlined a very critical part here. That's our part. Okay. It says, yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name. These words received and believe are the parts that we play. We must Receive. What does it mean to receive? If I were to give you a gift, you would have to hold out your hand, take it in your hand, pull it to yourself, and keep it. Friends, this is how we receive Jesus. We believe that God sent Jesus to save us and lead our lives, and we open our hearts to receive this gift from God. And gratitude and a growing faith is a great response to God's great gift. You see, our lives will never be the same after we believe enough to take in and receive Christ into our hearts. He's a gift. And so we don't have to work for this. We just have to be willing to say, Lord, I believe and I receive you. After we receive Jesus, we must make another step. You see, when we receive Jesus into our hearts, we are trusting him to be the Lord of our lives. So what does it mean that he's the Lord of our lives? What is a Lord? The Lord is the leader or the king. The boss of you is what I like to say. He's my boss of my life, of my soul, of my being, of my future, and all the things I desire. And so I need to trust that his ways and promises are best for me. We need to trust that. And we need to look to Jesus to follow his commands and directives day by day. And so when my way is different than my Lord's way, what must I do in order to be with him? I must change my ways. So think about it. If Jesus is walking west and my life journey is taking me east, who is the one who needs to change direction? This is true for both me and you. We need to go his way. His way is the right way. Now the Bible refers to this change as repentance. And it's an ongoing choice for us to change our direction when necessary. It's not always fun and it's not always easy, but God's ways and his directives will always lead us closer to him, giving us peace and contentment. You see, God is love, God is truth, 
God is righteousness. And when I choose to turn from my ways of doing things and do his things, do things his way in love in truth and righteousness, I walk with God because God is love and truth and righteousness. You see, this is what the Apostle Peter taught in step number two. Let's look at that on your paper. He wrote, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. You see, when brothers and sisters, when we turn from our ways to walk in love and truth and righteousness, times of refreshing come from the Lord. It's an incredible blessing. The longer we live this life with Christ, the more of this refreshing and blessing comes from the Lord and the more abundant and fulfilled our life is. Now there's one more very important step. I have it written on your paper, step number three. The Apostle Paul taught the church this. He said, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Brothers and sisters, we live in a world that is hostile towards the Christian faith. Some people will speak against you because you believe in something that they think is foolish. But when you have walked with the Lord in this loving fellowship, the joy and the peace is so great that the flack that you may receive from people who have not yet tasted of the goodness of God, it's nothing compared to the joy you will share with the Lord. And so when we experience the unkindness or disrespect of the world around us, let us remember what we were taught by others who experienced this. Let's listen to what the Apostle Paul told Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, he says this, Those who oppose him he must gently instruct in the hope that the Lord will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. And Peter wrote, But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So please never be ashamed to openly confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Think of what your confession can do for others. You just might help someone else find the hope and peace that Jesus freely offers to those who believe in him. Can you say this even now, right now with me? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Let's say that together. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. What a good confession. Now before we finish our time together, could we take some time to sing a song? Now this song might be considered a child song, but for those of us who are God's children, it's our song too. It's called, Jesus Loves Me. Let's sing that together.
I love that last verse. Jesus, take this heart of mine. Make it pure and holy thine. Thou hast bled and died for me. I will henceforth live for thee. What a good prayer. And I want to ask you as we close here today, can you believe and receive Jesus today? Can you repent of your sins so that Jesus can cleanse you from all of them and you can enter into this eternal relationship with him? Can you unashamedly confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord in your life? Well, perhaps you already have. And if you have not, there's a prayer on the bottom of your scripture page. And I want to read this for you. And if you think it's a good prayer, we can all pray this together. Okay? Let me read it first. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your love and for sending your Son Jesus to rescue us. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins and that God raised you from the dead. Wash away all my sins with your blood, Lord Jesus, and come into my heart that I may be born of God. I surrender my will to follow you, Jesus. Grant me the grace to walk and talk with you always. Is that a good prayer? Perhaps you've prayed a prayer like this before, but I invite you, all of you, let's pray this prayer together as those who want to walk and talk with Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Thank you for your love and for your sending your son, Jesus, to rescue us. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins and that God raised you from the dead. Wash away all my sins with your blood, Lord Jesus, and come into my heart that I may be born of God. I surrender my will to follow you, Jesus. Grant me the grace to walk and talk with you always. Amen. Amen. Friends, there is no greater life than the life we can live with Jesus. He pours out great blessings upon us, even in the midst of the greatest trials and challenges. He's there to walk with us and talk with us and assure us that we are in his grip. Well, until we come together again, go in peace and remember, God is love and he cares for you. Close to